one of the things that I think when it comes to gateways that I tend to look at is how it's used politically. And I don't mean in the literal sense of politics, like the Republican, Democrat, that type of stuff. But I mean, politically, I mean, the way that the messaging is sent out, the way Mm -hmm. that there is a campaign built around things that are gateway, because to your point, I would venture a guess, not specifically for you, but for a lot of people who do uh, go down the path of addiction, tobacco is in there at some point, cigarettes Mm -hmm. are in there at some point, Yes, but we don't consider them a gateway. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that we look at. We look at what they call gateways from the perspective that was sold to us through the dare commercials, through the Nancy Reagans of the world. And yes, that is a literal political person at that point. But <laughs> uh, she was very famous, obviously, for creating a lot of the drug, uh, anti-drug campaigns that came out of the United States, at least. Um, so I, I think that it's just when you're looking at what we consider gateways, it's important to be very careful in how we deem something gateway. Because like to your point for you, it's you specifically not putting this on other people. uh, It was access. What you had access to was the first things you kind of went to. And I think that's how it is for a lot of people. It's Mm -hmm. either access by what you can get your hands on individually or what the people around you have access to those Mm -hmm. who have friends or, or, Uh, family members or whoever else who have harder drugs available to them, they tend to have them go to them as well. Because it's like you said, it's not like there's a local corner store that's going to give you alcohol at 12, let alone crack cocaine uh, or cocaine itself or any of that type of stuff, right? So it's going to be access and then also just the person, the individual person's uh, desires, what they want to actually do and what they're looking for. Because Mm -hmm. for you, it sounds like, and forgive me if I ever put words in your mouth, I'm just trying to remember from your story. it sounds like for you, it was escapism. You were trying to escape your current mm-hmm. feelings, conditions, and everything that you were going through. And so you went with things that you felt would potentially give you that. And I think that mm-hmm. when you're looking at that type of uh, feeling, I just don't think it's, I think it's irresponsible to say, well, if she just hadn't had access to to marijuana, to to uh, alcohol or something like that. I, did, I just think it's irresponsible to put any kind of addiction or any kind of... Um, challenge that we go through in those circumstances on a single choice. It's not usually what it is. There's no one moment that if you hadn't done, it would have led you down another path. That's not how life works. Again, now that's one way that life isn't cartoonish and I'm thankful for it because in cartoons <laughs> that happens all the time. You have one choice you have to make and it'll ruin your whole life, right? Yeah. And and I mean, you said so many, so many good, insightful things there and you didn't get any of it wrong, so you don't have to worry. Um, I, I actually Give still time, struggle- I will. <laughs> I actually still struggle with uh, smoking addiction. <clears throat> so sorry about that. I'm so sorry. Um, I still struggle with smoking addiction. I struggle with, uh, you know, all sorts of sort of, I don't know, built up issues that I'm trying to unpack around that. And and you're right. Like it's, it's escapism and, and I could have gotten that in much, in my opinion, even worse places than drugs. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you look at, I mean, our brains are made of drugs, right? Like, I mean, there's so many chemicals that are literally like they get you euphoric or they get you depressed, just like, just like chemical drugs do. And so a lot of people, um, especially young women, young girls, um, especially at that time, I hope it's less, but I don't know, uh, self-harm is a place Mm -hmm. that people go. And I didn't go to self-harm until much later than, than when I first got addicted. But if I hadn't had access to marijuana and drinking. And I'm not saying that that it was a good thing, but I'm just saying that if I hadn't found that access, then Lord knows I may have, I may have just started cutting at 12 years old, which, you know, like there's, it had, it had so very little to do with the substances themselves and so much to do with, like you said, conditioning. And I think like, this is just a personal opinion and I'm sorry if if this is not something you agree with, but I think that we do young people a disservice by presenting drugs the way that we do, Mm -hmm. because I think that it either scares them into almost overreacting to it and believing that if I do, you know, if I do make a mistake, then I'm screwed for life, which is more likely to make them screwed for life. Mm -hmm. Or they see it as the perfect way to rebel. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's a disservice. I think that an education that is more well-rounded and an education on, on substance, like substances and a separate education on addiction because addiction goes far beyond substances mm-hmm. and it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with substances. Lots of people have a drink of wine with dinner and lots of people are raging alcoholics. You know, there's, there's definitely a difference. And I think that if we were to pull those apart and really 
look at them as separate issues, which they are, we would really be helping prevent addiction, or at least ones that were similar to my own experience. Well, the good thing, I think, even if we're in the early stages of it, is that we are starting to see differences in the way that we ch teach children in the sense that we teach basically two things with abstinence is the only choice, drugs mm -hmm. and sex. Mm -hmm. That's how we teach children to deal with them. So if, if you teach people who don't already have addictions or who, let me say it this way, there are certain people who for them, abstinence is the only possibility, right? That's just mm -hmm. a reality Absolutely. of some uh, addiction uh, tendencies and all these other various reasons for it. But what you can't do is teach everyone that. And that's what we do with our drug uh, education and our sex education. We teach them just don't. And so that doesn't actually make them informed consumers or informed, uh, I guess, constituents or however you want to term it, because they're just not doing it. And again, that may ultimately be the best choice for some people. But if you teach everybody that way, like you said, you create this, this pressure around it. You create this, I guess, sexiness, if you will. You know what I mean? Because kids, mm -hmm. when you're young, mm -hmm. don't touch that. Don't do that. Don't look down. Like whatever the don't is, is exactly what I want to do because that's part of like the psychology of becoming your own individual, right? Is you mm -hmm. first start to resist what you're being told from your parents. That's why babies at, as like young as two or whatever, one of the first words they really learn is no, because they're developing <laughs> individualism. They're developing their own sense. And they, one of the first ways to do that is it doesn't matter what you're telling them not to do. I want to say no. And then they've done like research on this stuff too. You know, the whole ideology of sending your daughter away to Catholic school so she doesn't get pregnant. Well, that doesn't set her up for life because then as soon as she gets a taste of freedom, she's going to do a lot of different things. And again, let me be clear about this. I'm not saying women. This is specific to women. I'm just mm -hmm. using that idea, uh, that example because that's one of the common ones they do. Like send your, your girl away to school so she'll be chased and she won't get pregnant. I'm like, that will last for maybe those years she's there. But as soon as she leaves, she's going to do what anybody would do, which is find out who she is as a person. And that mm -hmm. may mean being promiscuous. It may not be. It's different for every person. But the point is you do your child a a disservice if you take away their choice. If you don't just have conversations with them about these things, instead of just telling them, don't do that and never explaining yourself to do as you, I say, not as I do, because let's be honest, mm -hmm. how many parents are out there drinking, telling their kids not to drink, smoking mm -hmm. weed and telling their kids not to smoke or whatever the, the don't do it is. And you know that their parents are doing it. Your children aren't dumb. They see that. Mm -hmm. And especially now that we're in our thirties, we're, we're young enough to remember those days and we're old enough to know that the, what our parents are doing at the time at this time, because I don't know about how old your parents were when you were, uh, you know, growing up, but my mom's 18 years older than me. So my, my mom is my age. Six years older than me. Yeah. So, uh, so another uh, nine, well, I can't do math right now. Eight, eight <laughs> years. Uh, but uh, so when, when my mom was my age, I was 17. So you think that she had this all figured out? Because I certainly don't. And my mom is <laughs> definitely a better person than me, but I, I, she didn't have the world figured out at 35 and neither do I. So why are we trying to pretend to our kids that we do? Why are we trying to pretend to our kids that we can just tell you don't do these things and you'll be fine? Like that's, that's not the way it works. And on the complete flip side of that, which is I've been waiting to shoehorn this into the conversation, <laughs> for, but there, <laughs> I just learned about this relatively recently. There is a, uh, a professor at Columbia, I believe it is, who uses heroin. And like he, okay. he talked about how he's very controlled with it and he has like a lot of rules built around him and stuff like that. But so you're, you're talking about the way that we've treated these drugs for so many years is not the way that they actually work. And I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. people go out and start doing heroin. Like <laughs> nobody should take that message away from this. What I am saying is <laughs> there is a lot of levels to what we talk about with drugs, what we talk about with sex, what we talk about with child rearing and these abstinence mi mindsets that we go, which is it's all or nothing does a lot of people a disservice and it does a lot of us no good. And we don't really start to learn about these things until we're much older. And I'm, I'm hopeful. And I've also seen some of the changes coming that we are starting to address those things in different ways. And I hope that obviously that education continues because if you're not doing something and that's your only way of interacting with it, you're not necessarily as strong as you, you maybe could be, you know what I mean? Like we talk about alcohol because of how social it is, uh, socially acceptable, mm -hmm. I should say. To your point, a lot of people can have one glass of wine. But what if we mm -hmm. just had a pure abstinence with it? We just never touched it. Everybody's a teetotaler, right? They can't touch the stuff ever. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different lifestyle. And is that the way that we actually build those skills to learn how to be um, controlled and not just, like you said, one drink of wine. Now I, I don't know what day it is. You know, three days later, I'm waking up in Tijuana or something. <laughs> well, and I think um, I think that, like you said, uh, again, you said so many things that are very relevant to to my thoughts on the situation. I mean, I think that we've seen evidence of of prohibition not working both with alcohol earlier mm -hmm. on and with 
with, you know, illicit sub- substances now. And as far as that professor goes, I actually, I, I mean, it's, it's such a difficult thing to balance because I don't, mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. I don't want to like encourage people to go use heroin, but <laughs> yeah, at yeah. the same time, I think that if we, okay, I always, I always use the, when I, when I end up talking about this, I always use the analogy of a hammer. So you can build a house with a hammer or you can smash someone's head in, you know, and we don't try to make hammers illegal just because they can be used violently or poorly. You can also hurt yourself with a hammer. You know, you can do all sorts of damage with a hammer or you can do all sorts of building up. And I'm not saying like, like basically what it comes down to is that substances are a tool. Like, like let's look at cocaine. So cocaine when used topically is a very effective medicine. We use derivatives of it in, in medicine today, like Novocaine and solar cane and almost all the canes are, are, are based on the same. Um, what is the word for that? Uh, anest- anesthetic properties mm-hmm. of cocaine, you know, um, with heroin. I mean, heroin is <clears throat> derived of the same stuff as codeine, uh, the same stuff as, as like, like literally dozens of popular painkillers mm-hmm. and and it's when it's monitored appropriately and understood well then it's not nearly as dangerous and, and i mean really like adults using drugs responsibly is a lot less of a problem than the effects of the government trying to fight adults using drugs and like, I mean, when it comes to children, though, things are complicated um, because the brain doesn't finish developing until, you know, they say 25. Some people it's going to be 23. Some people it's going to be 27. Mm-hmm. But they say 25. And the effects of, of that development isn't really well understood. So, like, let's say it was 25. So we don't know if, you know, let's say let's pick pot. So you you smoke pot for five years. We don't know if that means that your brain's not going to finish developing until you're 30 or if it means that your brain just stops developing for five of those years and you only get 20 years of development. We don't really know. It's mm-hmm. very hard to study, especially with everything being illegal. So with children, like to me, when I interact with children about it, and thankfully I haven't had too much, but I try and I always always talk to their parents first because I'm not a total butthead, you know, but mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but when I have had to, I, I try to help them understand that it's that's something that makes more sense to explore later. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's a it's a complicated, complicated issue for sure. Yeah, and I want to be clear, just in case it came off like I was, I am not advocating for child drug use. That's not the of point. Course. Of what course, I'm advo- and I, I know I know you understand me, but I just want to make that clarification <laughs> before people you know, start running with this, right? But um, what I am advocating for is honest communication with children about more topics, whether mm-hmm. it is sexuality, whether it is. Uh, and when I say sexuality, I don't mean specifically homosexuality, heterosexuality. I mean just sexuality in general, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and drug use. Because, again, kids are not as dumb as we pretend they are, especially with mm-hmm. the Internet. You're not fooling any yeah. of them with the nonsense you're telling them. Reefer madness is not going to work as some kind of uh, some kind of tactic to keep them away from it. They're going to do it if they feel like doing it. And it's better that you have those open conversations with them about it so they can really make those choices for themselves. Because think about it this way. Again, not trying to get political, but a lot of these conversations mm-hmm. like lean towards political type Just things. Just naturally right? lead there, yeah. 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 Well, we, we get mad when the government lies to us because we want the full information set to make choices as full-fledged adults or human beings even. Mm-hmm. How do you think your kids feel? Your kids are in the midst of fully developing who they are as a person, and they can tell when you're lying. You're not Denzel Washington, you know what I mean? You're not this great <laughs> actor who's out there just selling to your uh, your kids on this thing, this Oscar-worthy performance you're giving. No, they know you're lying, and now they don't respect your word as much. And then while you're telling them that, they're getting information from either TV or from the internet or from their friends or from wherever source they're getting it, and you are now being tuned out. They know you don't know what you're talking about at worst or at or excuse me, at best, or at worst, they think you're just openly lying to them about things. And so they're going to form their own opinions and potentially, as you said before, rebel. Just have open conversations with your children. And the best thing you can do for your children is give them the full set of information and then hope that the way that you've raised them and the choices they make, make them a good person. You can never stop your kid from being Jeffrey Dahmer or whatever else you want that you're worried about them becoming. At some point, they're going to make the choices for themselves. And that's why it's important to give them information to do so. That's exactly that's exactly how I view it. Now, of course, I'm not yet a parent. Um, hopefully one day, but you know, 
<laughs> that's, that's not up to me. Um, but I think the question of like what you're talking about is autonomy, right? And the question of autonomy versus protecting children is is kind of an age old question, but it's especially relevant now. People are talking a lot more about autonomy and and it can, like anything, swing too far in the other direction where, you know, people are asking permission to to change their their infants diapers and stuff and it's like well that that doesn't work because they don't have the capacity yeah. and the tools to have that level of communication and stuff yet so it becomes really really complicated but i i tend to agree is i think erring on the side of giving your children freedom and and giving them just a an apt education i mean like like we talked a little bit about you know that lying thing and how it feels like your parents are lying that's exactly what i went through when i first started doing like um what I call like hard drugs. So like ecstasy, MDMA, cocaine, all that stuff. Um, when I started doing that, the like I literally had like the cognitive thought that my parents had been lying to me and that I couldn't trust them on anything because this was so fun and they told me that it was bad, you mm-hmm. know? And I mean, now I realize that it wasn't in, like I, I wouldn't have fun in those same experiences today, but, but I, I remember thinking that is, oh, obviously I can't trust them with anything. Absolutely, because I think at certain ages, your your parents are omnipotent. They know all, they mm-hmm. can control all, they are the entirety of your authority figures, right? It, um, and then you start to slowly, that starts to chip away naturally through life. You start to realize that you're human beings and everything. But once you start, you're already on the process of realizing they're human beings, then you realize they're lying and they've told you, I almost every parent that I know has said this to their kid one time or another, right? Don't lie. Lying is bad. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't lie. And then you realize they've been doing it your entire life. And you're like, what? Like everything you've said is built on a a foundation of lies. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so you just start to question those type of things. And then they also, while lying to you, haven't given you the information that you need to actually make the choices for yourself. That's just, like I said, I just think about what you, it feels like to be lied to and then take it a step back because yes, there's certain things with children that it is a very different world, as you said, uh, both because they're physically and mentally developing, both because there's a lot of legality uh, challenges around it and all that type of stuff too. Uh, but I'm just saying like the more honest we're able to be with children, the better the world will be is, is well, my general opinion. Yeah. And, and mine too. And you touched on a really excellent point about parents being omnipotent. Um, when like it's, <laughs> I was like a, full grown adult before I realized that my parents were just humans. And I know that that sounds ridiculous, but I think it's more common than it sounds Mm -hmm. where, you know, like I when I say full blown adult, I mean, well past the brain development mark, Um, like more like a couple years ago. And, and it just dawned on me that I had this pedestal up and that's something to be considered too, when you choose. And I mean, of course there's nuance to it. There are going to be times where it's most appropriate to lie, but remembering that you're not talking about the same thing as as a friend lying to a friend or a peer Mm -hmm. lying to a peer but you're talking about the ultimate level of trust these little humans believe in you in a way that your peers and siblings and parents never will (laughs) you know they they believe that you are you know the next thing to to a god like after god then it's your parents Mm -hmm. you know and so that being so big, you know, they say the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That's, Mm -hmm. that's a hundred percent true. So you just want to be mindful if you are going to lie to your children, that it's for good reason and that you can explain it if it's asked about. (laughs) Well, and I think that you have to realize too, that every lie has an expiration date, the Mm -hmm. tooth fairy, Santa Claus, even if they're those type of childlike lies, they have expiration dates. And depending on how you handle those expiration dates and how you actually put all that stuff into effect, I think could really determine how effective they can be and how effective your mm-hmm. relationship with your child ultimately can be. And let me be clear, I don't have children either. And that's why a lot of these conversations fall on deaf ears. He's like, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. And to some extent, they're they're correct in that as well, right? But what I think, again, the point we're talking about is a generality. We're not talking about your kid. We're talking about mm-hmm. kids. We're talking about the entirety mm-hmm. of every child who who's lived, right? And again, in the internet world, it's so much harder to lie to your kids. Because you're like, oh, well, my kid doesn't mm-hmm. have a phone. Yeah, but their friends do. Yeah, they can go. To, they can get on the mm-hmm. internet. They're going to get on the internet. There's like no way you could completely <laughs> Their stop that. Their schools have without... tablets for them to use. Exactly. Unless you are living in some kind of uh, sect, if you will, uh, that's just outside of society. You know, you could still go to the gas station, but your kids are 100% controlled. And like you have the, everybody else in that entire group agreeing upon it. They're going to get access to this information. You can't hide mm-hmm. it from them. So again, what you want to do, in my opinion 
is prepare them for that. Like, so a, a recent example that has come up a lot in the, the news uh, around the world is, you know, race and stuff like that and how uh, parents, uh, black parents, particularly my mother's white and I'm, I'm black. So she told me about it anyways, but uh, <laughs> it, it's like dealing with the police or like how people may treat you because you're, they see you as a different color and so on and so yep. forth. Right. So if you think kids can handle that, but they can't learn about weed then like what are you what are you talking about one of them is may kill them i am not aware of anybody who has directly died from marijuana they may have Mm -hmm. died from choices they made while in marijuana but that's a whole other conversation to be had at some other point right but my so i guess my point is again yes as you said you lie to kids lying to children sometimes become necessary because i've heard kids i have nieces and nephews and i have friends with kids and stuff like that and the why so the why is the sky blue why is at some point i'm lying i I absolutely get those (laughs) lies you're gonna lie about that and i support those lies right but just with the bigger topics lie for a little bit but again has an expiration date make sure that you're the one who causes it to expire don't let them find out from one of their friends because now their friends are the source of truth and you're the source of lies because you're a parent. And mm-hmm. I think that's just a very dangerous game to play. I couldn't agree more. And I'm so sorry for interrupting you there, but um, I couldn't agree more because like, I mean, I'm not a parent, but I've spent a lot of time talking to not only parents, but you know, psych- like psych- psychiatry, psychological professionals mm-hmm. about both adult and child psychiatry. I've spent time talking to like a neuroscientist about how the brain works and all sorts of stuff like that. And you know, so I'm not, I'm not just pulling it out of my ass, but at the same time, I, you know, I understand that I'm not a parent. And like you said, it will probably fall on deaf ears in in some people's cases. And that's, that's okay. Because I think, I think the people who are, you know, who, who are needing to hear it will hear it, you know? Thanks for checking out Starting Nowhere. Come find us on Facebook so you can comment on this and other clips and episodes of Starting Nowhere.